meeting with me. Um, our code of contact, uh, code of conduct monitor will be Alice Prail, and our tech liaison is Nancy Adams. Um, so some reminders, the session is governed by our code of conduct, which you can um, find here at this link, and also the community agreement. So we'll have one person speaking at a time. Remember that everyone has something to contribute. We're aiming for equitable participation, um, and please feel comfortable participating, even if you're unsure about terminology, especially in this kind of session. We're here for anything you need. Um, be aware and consider of time, embrace curiosity, and acknowledge the difference between impact and intent. So instructions for the session, um, they're not too complicated. Ask a question. Um, these can be questions related to workflows, policies, things that you're struggling with, or something you'd like community advice or guidance about. You can submit questions using this form, um, and it can be anonymous, so you don't have to drop your name, but you can if you'd like to. Um, and I think we'll probably get this dropped in the chat as well. Uh, you'll see in the form that we will be sorting the questions based on progressive stacking. The progressive stack is a method for giving marginalized groups a greater chance to speak. Uh, this identification will not be in public view and any information collected will be deleted after the event. All of these submitted questions will be viewable at this link and I'll share it to the screen once I'm done with the slides um, and we'll drop that in the chat as well. And you can answer any question you want using this form um, that we'll have linked here. And you can also enter answers into the Zoom chat and Joe will field that for us. And so just a summary, ask your question. The questions will be displayed on screen and feel free to answer a question. That's it. So um, let me switch over, stop sharing. Okay. One second. Break. Oops. Sorry, I have to get out of these slides. There we go. Okay. Um, Zoom is not letting me. There we go. Okay. So we'll get started. And we actually already have some questions ready to go, which is awesome. Brown, do you want me to start with one or do you want to do the first one? Um, I can go ahead and do the first one, sure. Cool. So first one, if we can navigate. What advice do you all have for an organization that is just starting to use BitCurator? Tips? resources, things you wish you knew when you'd started. A few seconds for folks to start answering that one. You need to refresh because on my screen, I'm seeing at least one answer for this one. Yeah, so, oh, can I speak up a little? Yes, I can try and speak up a little. Is that any better? It was for me. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so we, we do have one uh, answer to start. Uh, starting the conversation early with your IT department will be helpful, particularly in determining what support they may or may not offer Linux endpoints and what steps it might take to move collection materials from the bit curator, whether it's a VM or um, to, to long-term storage because different IT departments have different, this is my answer, so I have a little more context on it. Um, different IT departments have different levels of support and rules regarding uh, different types of operating system endpoints. I don't see any others on this one yet, so we can move on to the next one. Yeah, sounds good. And I'll try to keep refreshing the screen as we go through. Um, but again, please feel free to pop into the chat if you have an answer. OK, this one got pushed to the top, so I'm going to go to this one next. Uh, what disk imaging software would you use to image optical disks on a Mac? Um, and we have a couple of answers to this question from Kayla. So thank you, Kayla. First one is for command line, I use CDR DAO, DD Rescue for GUI, Roxio Toast, or built-in disk utility imaged as a CD master. 
Uh, and we have another answer saying yes to DD Rescue for creating ISO files from optical media, um, but we do not attempt to image all optical media. I would love to know why you don't attempt to image all optical media, or do you just pull files instead of imaging? We have to talk. Is that how this works? Sure. Yeah, because um, some can't be, uh, and you know, like using CDRIO, like you know, we, we pull WAV files from op, uh, audio CD. Some CD, uh, some optical media will just you know pull the files off and and put them in a, a tar file. Yeah, so we have sense. sort of specific guidelines for when to image optical media. Awesome, thank you. I'll do one more refresh just in case, but yeah, I think we're good on that one. Thank you. All right, um, moving on to the next one. Having worked in a variety of settings now, I've found that, quote, accessioning as processing, end quote, workflows are sometimes unrealistic when it comes to careful and responsible stewardship of born digital material. At a previous job, I clashed with a curator and accessioning archivist about this and was forced to reinterpret the process of accessioning. Why not just call it what it is? It's processing. This is setting us up for failure and leading to unkept promises and burnout. Where do folks draw the line between these two related but different workflows? Not seeing any answers to this one yet. Why don't we move on? And if folks have answers to this, we can return to it uh, later in the session. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. I, 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 sorry, feedback. Um, sorry, hi, everyone. Hi, this is. Hello, sorry. OK, um, so we'll come back to that if we see any answers pop up. Next question. I Leo, I think Leo might have had something to share. I'm not sure what happened there. Leo, you were um, muted. I'm not sure if you had an um, answer to share this question. Um, I did. Sorry for, for, hey. for barging in like this. I joined late, so I don't know exactly what the what you've discussed as the as the right process for answering questions. Um, shall I go on to Airtable and answer it, or do we answer them live or in the chat? What's the best way? Uh, so Airtable is great. The link should be in the chat, but you can also, if you have an answer, feel free to raise your hand and yeah, go ahead and uh, let us know. Got you. Okay. Can I provide an answer for this one? Absolutely. Excellent. So um, this is a very good question. And uh, yesterday when Emma and I um, presented our workflows, this was an area that we didn't get the chance to talk about a lot, but it was certainly one of these aspects of our um, archival forensics workflow that we had to think long and hard because uh, of exactly what you know is being asked here. Um, there was um, a misunderstanding from, I guess, the institution and uh, possibly our managers that um, accessioning digital stuff was the same as forensically processing them. Um, so what we did was use the the workflow um and uh, i guess um formulate it in such a way and and qualify it uh, by making it a public workflow so that um there is a very clear uh, understanding a very and a very clear explanation across everyone and making it public meant that and i guess not just making the workflow public but also disseminating it it meant that there was um, extra leverage, if you want, um, in terms of establishing and re reinforcing the, you know, the the differences uh, between between the two things. Essentially, what we've done by joining the archival forensics workflow with the broader with our broader digital archiving workflow was to make a very clear case that 
at the point of accessioning, what we're going to do is in most cases create um, a forensic image of digital stuff, especially when it came to um, uh, storage media. And the rest of it was not part of accessioning, but it was a process of appraisal. So once we've accessioned it and um, potentially created an, an image file, we can then revisit it at a later point in that archival uh, forensics workflow and do <laughs> the processing. And um, so far, so good. We, we've been running with this for the past uh, uh, six, seven months. Um, there's only been one uh, challenge from um, um, from some of our senior colleagues and having that very public declaration of what we mean with what sort of clarifies it. You know, it, as I said, it provides a point where we can go and say, look, this is what we're doing. We might, you might want us to go and do all the processing and all the analysis and so on, but we don't have the time and we don't have the resources. So that might be a, a, a solution. Thanks so much, Leo. I see a couple of hands raised. I think Emily had um, their hand up first, so we'll start there. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think a lot about this, what the difference between accessioning and processing is for born digital collection, collections. Um, and I'm part of the best practices for accessioning group that's coming up with a list of uh, recommendations for best practices for accessioning of born digital materials. Um, but basically, I, I think that this is going to vary a lot across institutions. But for me, um, the goals of accessioning are to establish like secure custody of the materials and address any immediate areas of concern that are going to pose a threat to the materials or the storage environment. And that may get worse over time. Um, so that really, for me, includes virus scanning, um, making sure to uh, look at media carriers that may be degrading and that may um, that a copy may need, need to be made immediately um, as well as um, identifying file formats just to kind of get at what the kind of most uh, threatening issues may be for a collection and then uh, in terms of like actually doing analysis and scanning for certain types of information that typically happens at the processing level um, but it's kind of different also with different collections. Um, some of our collections are going to get item level processing and be put onto our Islandora uh, repository. So um, that kind of metadata creation and item level processing is also part of the processing workflow and not accessioning. So I hope that's at least a little bit helpful. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. And we've got actually lots of answers and hands raised. So this is great. Um, Tori, you are up next, I think, and then Alice. Sorry, I had to get a sip of water there. Um, so in my institution, the line's kind of fuzzy between accessioning and processing um, for Born Digital. What generally happens is more like two rounds of accessioning. Like um, since most of the Born Digital that we get comes in um, as part of a hybrid collection, what usually happens is there will be a note in the accession record that there's born digital. I'll get a heads up from whoever brought in the collection um, and, or whoever's accessioning it. Um, um, and then um, later, depend, like, oh, I think we might have lost Tori there. Oh, no, I got um, muted. Oh, okay, okay. You're good to go. Sorry about that. Okay, cool. Yeah, no worries. Um, so then later, um, we'll do a more born digital specific workflow that involves inventorying any physical media, retrieving the files, um, checking for PII or viruses, and then moving to a processing staging area. So really, at that point, unless there's something really glaring. Um, like a blank disk 
or something commercially available that we don't collect or something like that, appraisal isn't really happening. Um, it's basically just getting them to a point where they are ready to be reviewed um, with like that appraisal and processing mindset. Um, however, sometimes this happens during processing if um, it's a backlog collection, but that is generally how it's worked out with stuff coming in. Um, I've also done accessioning as processing workflows in the past. Um, that's where I think my line would be if, yeah, it's, it's really, it, it, they're really related. It's just, I think my line would be processing is you're trying to get detailed enough intellectual control for researchers to use it. And it's not just a, here is a minimally described unprocessed collection good luck. Um, like if you're expecting, if you have a kind of intellectual control where you can use it and you've made those kinds of, here's how these things relate to other things. Here is a detailed account of what's in here. Um, we might come back to it and officially for real process it, but it's unlikely. Um, I think that's where I, I would call it more processing. Um, accessioning, I think is just getting it to the point where, at least in my context, it's getting it to the point where you don't need me to look at the files. Um, so any of the other archivists can work with those files um, describe what's in them, arrange them as needed. Um, and there's not gonna be any kind of like weird technical, there's not gonna be many hopefully weird technical issues or um, anything like that, that or things that need to come off of drive. Awesome, thank you so much, Tori. And I think this will be our last one from Alice and we have tons of answers in the um, air table. So please feel free to go look at those after our session, they'll still be there. Go ahead, Alice, thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is a great question and a lot of great answers. Um, so I'll keep this brief, um, but we also created a public definition of what accessioning was. And that aligned with how our staffing model worked at the time, which was having staff create some minimal description and then send it to our accessioning service um, for disk imaging, file transfer, some minimal uh, stabilization information gathering tasks. Um, and so I think having that public definition helped, but part of that definition was also acknowledging how in Born Digital, um, accessioning sort of isn't also off has to be mixed in with other tasks like preservation, like moving things to some kind of preservation storage um, so that it can be circled back. Uh, appraisal, it's really outside of our current model to accession things and then appraise them. But with Born Digital, you kind of have to often in order to capture the files and then view them off of, you can't have the donor plugging in a, a floppy drive. Um, so yeah, that that mixing of, uh, of what has traditionally been sort of separate tasks and just acknowledging that this is, has to be really collaborative and um, that there's so much overlap, uh, I think has been helpful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alice. All right, um, we'll move on to our next one. Yeah, I think it. Okay. Um, long term ape storage. What are folks using? Deep storage with AWS Glacier, Preservica, local server, et cetera. How's the process been creating a workflow to put the completed apes into designated storage location? We have a couple of answers for this one. Um, one organization is currently using an AWS setup with Archive Navica as the preservation software with planned distribution storage in our distributed digital preservation repository, 
which is using both AWS and Wasabi, another solution for uh, cloud storage, as well as local data storage. Our workflows are still in progress, but we have been working on implementing levels of preservation and levels of preservation storage that will eventually send materials to different types of storage based on machine actionable metadata that aligns with the levels determinations. We're still working on uh, uh, dissemination access packages for born digital materials, however. And another group is using offline storage of LTO tapes uh, with a vendor called Digital Bedrock for artwork data. They write our, our data to three tapes stored in different locations. Creating the workflow was time consuming, but worth the effort. Um, this was from, uh, and it helped understand the files in the collection better. And this was from the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, giving folks another moment to respond to that one. Say for our part, we've we've used both LTO tape and are now using Azure as our cloud storage provider. But I think there's a, a variety of, of options there. All right, maybe moving. Oh, and one more answer. Let's see, we've got sorry, I'm just loading it here. One one copy on site on disk, monitored by a locally developed app application. Back up to tape via campus IT, a copy pushed to APT, that's Academic Preservation Trust, I think, uh, with born digital content in S3 and most digitized content with deep pleasure. We lost a ton of data two summers ago and it was all restored from APT successfully. Their institution, Archivematica plus DuraCloud with the Ontario Library Research Cloud as the storage backend is used by many in Ontario. There's a link there. We are still developing our workflows, but are planning to use the new Vault distributed server preservation storage offered by Internet Archive. So again, a variety of options. I think we can probably uh, move on. All right. Next question, is anyone taking the type of automatically generated metadata from tools like Data Accessioner, Droid, or others, and transforming it for access purposes, like take the XML metadata that Data Accessioner makes and use it to populate fields in a DAMS for public online access? Um, this is from Kate. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, I would love to make more use of technical metadata that we pull from image and audiovisual files for access purposes, but I can't say that we do that yet. Uh, the next answer says, I have a tool that extracts file properties from a directory to a spreadsheet, and we've been using that as item file lists attached to description. Not populating fields, but I imagine you could with a Python script or something. I'm going to refresh this to see if we've got any more. Yep. Not exactly like your example, but I have developed a tool to take file system metadata, file names, paths, file sizes, and generate EAD for the two levels of a directory with a link to GitHub. That sounds great. Can't wait to look at that. Um, I have done this myself, actually. Uh, we are now using um, LibSafe for our digital preservation, and they make it really easy to do this, to pull, especially from like an Excel file or something, um, fields into metadata, and it's been fantastic. Oh, we have another answer. Let's see, we've got, yes, we use Droid to create a manifest of files open for research. We make some changes to make it a bit easier to digest and then link it to the collection for download by users as a spreadsheet. Uh, I create a tree report into a text file and have shared that as an inventory. Let's see if we've got any more. Just mine. <laughs> Thanks for adding that. Uh, and Lauren dropped something in the chat. I've been hacking away a bit at this transform with other folks at UVA. Need some updating. It's for Droid to premise, but I think the transform can be really useful for some kinds of descriptive metadata as well. With the link to GitHub. Thank you so much, Lauren. That's awesome. Cool. Might give it a second for any other answers, but I think we can probably move on. All right. Great. Thanks, everybody. All 
Uh, okay, what is your process to extract files for access from disk images? Say a disk image of a computer drive. We have several answers already, um, starting with, it would probably depend on what file systems are present on the disk. I'd want to get a sense of that first before determining how to extract files. Um, second answer is, other than using uh, BitCurator disk image accesses program, I will simply mount a copy of the raw image in an operating system and copy off the files. And the third answer, sometimes we'll read only mount uh, the image for access, we'll mount and copy or rsync files, we'll also uh, carve files from the image with SleuthKit or HFS Explorer, uh, but that's more of a processing step than an access step. And uh, someone dropped the GitHub link to uh, the Canadian Center for Architecture's disk image processor, which uh, does some stuff, including Brunhilde, and I think it uses the sleuth kit and maybe others to carve uh, materials from disk images. If there are any others, see anything there? Nothing else in chat at the moment. So perhaps we can move on. All right, next question. Can anyone provide an example of any articles, blogs, or anything else that talks about processing approach for a collection containing born digital archival materials that were created using non-English software systems? but processed by a US, Canada, or other English-based institution. I'm having a hard time finding concrete examples. Um, our first answer says, Elvia Arroyo Ramirez discusses character encoding in this fabulous Medium article that I have referred to many times, so highly recommend. Thanks for that answer. <laughs> and duplicated. <laughs> Lots of people love Elvia's article on this. It's great. I'll give it a minute just in case we have any other answers come in. Okay. Um, I think we can probably move on. Don't see anything else in the chat or the or table. Yeah, so this one, sorry, energy multiple windows here. Is a right blocker necessary, a necessary component for working with digital materials? I'm having a hard time convincing my boss to invest in one. Are there, uh, so, I mean, are there ways to preserve authenticity besides using a write blocker? There are several answers on this one already, starting with, uh, there are changes you can make to device mounting behaviors at the operating system level, although my understanding is that these aren't foolproof. Another answer, some types of media can also be directly write blocked, so it may be less of an issue if you're processing three and a half inch floppy disks or read only optical media. You could try USB write blocker all uh, as software to write block your USB ports, but I'm not sure how effective the tool is. Uh, third answer, a write blocker makes things more error proof. Unless your boss thinks you're infallible, they should <laughs> support having one so things are safer. Uh, you can establish a fixity value on the original media and then copy uh, and a copy location in order to make sure things haven't changed, but just hooking a writable drive to a computer can change it in ways that aren't easily visible. Uh, I would argue it is essential because otherwise you're depending on a perfect use of attaching external media read only every single time. Uh, and finally, I would say this piece of equipment is unfortunately a baseline necessity if you want to ensure that you are not modifying data on accessioned materials like hard drives. Maybe there's a way you could make an argument to, by comparing to paper materials. In other words, an archive would take measures to prevent them from being changed. Yeah, I don't see any others at the moment, but I, I think the consensus is that unfortunately it, it is kind of um, the best way to ensure that things are not changed or modified.
seeing anything in chat or refreshing. Do you want to highlight something Lauren Work uh, mentioned in the chat uh, about the last question about uh, languages? I'm thinking this might be a good space to maybe look for uh, toward international groups like IPRES or international archives communities that may have done additional research. I think that's a great suggestion and we should capture that in our knowledge base. One more refresh and I think we can move on. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight a really great comment in chat from Emily that if you do use a USB write blocker, please test it. Um, don't assume it works. And it sounds like there's a story behind that one. Always good to test your equipment. How do folks approach the discovery of PII embedded in visual images, for example, a JPEG depicting someone's credit card, anyone using any OCR and NLP tools? This is a nice tie back to the presentation yesterday um, about using bulk extractor for um, you know, kind of consistent review. And, and I think there was some discussion of it, you're not going to catch every single thing using the tools that are available to us. And, and there may be strategies to address this overall, but some, some of what we're doing is, is um, you know, proving that we've put things through a rigorous process and, and understanding that nothing's 100%. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and I've had conversations with folks about how we we really don't do this for paper records or not to the extent that tools like Bulk Extractor can can help us with um, and things slip through the cracks. So I think, you know, having realistic expectations about being able to find everything will go a long way. Um, and being clear about that in your documentation is is really helpful. Ah, oh, great, we have some answers. <laughs> well, one's just saying they love this question. Uh, this makes me wonder what Android and iPhones do. I've searched my own personal records for credit card or ID to find photos I've taken of these things and have found them that way. Yeah, actually Google Drive will do that too, with uh, or Google Photos, I should say. Yeah, and then the question there is whether they're so they're clearly they're, they're understanding based on the image data, but are they then writing that metadata into the EXIF for the photograph or, or doing some other way of marking that? Would be interesting mm -hmm. to know. All right. Oh. Uh... Oh, <laughs> adding some answers from live. Okay, let's see. Not an answer, sorry, but we've been thinking of a mechanism for researchers to report when they come across PII information for physical material and digital. Um, and actually, I should, this reminds me, we actually do this uh, here at Princeton. We have um, a little bubble that pops up in our finding aids um, that we have folks use for any kind of general answers, but there is also a function of that tool that is specifically for reporting when they find uh, something that they weren't supposed to see. So that's a great suggestion. Okay, I think that we are done with this one, so I'll move to the next. All right. Um, when reviewing and processing digital records on a non-networked computer, how do you then get them onto the network or a network to go to storage? Wouldn't more copying introduce um, more opportunities or introduce opportunities for errors? There are several answers to this one. Um, hi, we use rsync uh, dash a. It's a is for archive mode or rsync RLTV, which is recursive, copy links, timestamps, and verbose. 
rsync is a command line tool, but BitCurator also comes with grsync installed, which is the GUI uh, for transferring files and allows you to have options like preserve timestamps. Uh, another answer would be creating and documenting fixity and then checking and verifying it after each copy action would hedge against this vulnerability. Uh, I would, uh, would make sure I capture fixity information at each step to ensure no step along the way introduces errors. Uh, third answer, fourth answer, the same principles apply. Check the fixity values on either side of a copy to make sure that nothing changed. Using a structure like Bagit can help. You can easily check the fixity values and the file inventory to make sure everything copied over correctly. Uh, we process records on a FRED, forensic recovery of evidence device uh, machine, and then use a hard drive to sneaker net it over to an ingest workstation. Uh, very high tech answer here. We manually plug and unplug an ethernet cable. And uh, this veers away from your question because it is a network solution, but for folks who primarily acquire digital records via network transfers, I thought it helpful to add that we move files from box drive to BitCurator using grsync and also set up a shared folder between the BitCurator environment and our networked environment. So I think a consensus around fixity, whether that is via Bagit or another method, um, rsync is a good error a tool with kind of um, error checking built in. Um, uh, we use TerraCopy to transfer. It does fixity checking as it goes. It also has a verify function. I'll, I'll editorially add. Not seeing anything else. Believe we can move on in that case. Great. I think I've seen one pop up to the top. Um, so I'm going to hop over to that one. Um, is there a way to integrate the use of SharePoint, uh, SharePoint <laughs> storage option provided by IT department and Fedora, Archive's preferred long-term storage option? Having two storage options is good. However, Fedora offers the Archive's more control over the management of the digital files in its custody. <laughs> Every time a question comes up about SharePoint, I, I sigh for people. Um, not fun to work with. I see some agreement in the chat. <laughs> I can't think of a way off. This is not a maybe the, the end all answer, but I can't think of a way without having a, a, a point in between those two. I honestly don't know if those two systems can be connected. Um, kind of manual intervention. Yeah, I'm not familiar with any way to do that myself either. And I'm not seeing any answers come in, although Elvia says SharePoint isn't that bad. I'll, I'll choose to believe you. <laughs> Well, hopefully at some point, somebody will have some kind of answer to this, but I think it might just be that there's not really an easy way to do this. Um, so I think we can move on to the next one. All right. When and how do you decide to deaccession and dispose of magnetic and born digital media? It's from Michael Gates. Thank you for that question. Uh, a couple answers already. Um, after we appraise, process, and deposit extracted files into our preservation repository, we make the, a decision on the storage media. Our default is to deaccession the media, but we review to decide if there is artifactual value. If we decide to deaccession, we document the reasoning, and then and then the curator and director sign off on the deaccession and the action to take: destroy, return to the donor, or offer to another organization. Second answer, we have a policy that in general, we do not retain original media once the files have been processed. Realistically processing doesn't always happen very quickly. So we try to dispose of it sooner, maybe a few months after ingest. We make multiple backups of what we do ingest. Uh, so we generally feel comfortable with that. Uh, we have a log to track when files were ingested and the status of the original media. Of course, there could be exceptions depending on the exact nature of the accession where we might retain it longer or permanently, but as a rule, we do discard. 
And third, waiting until we start running out of physical storage space, but for now we keep them as an emergency backup. I will, um, I will plus one that, that last one for, for me. <laughs> Seeing anything on the refresh? See anything in chat? One more refresh. All right, I think we can move on. Oh, I think we actually have a follow up question from Alice. How do you advocate for deaccessioning and disposal? Should we be, or is it fine to wait for space to run out? That's a good question, Alice. A really um, good question. My department yeah. loves deaccessioning. <laughs> so we don't have to really convince anyone. I have an answer. We generally dispose of media carriers after processing or ingest. For collections where ingest isn't an option, we likely will still dispose since we maintain multiple copies of files. Yeah, there's some follow-ups to Alice in the chat. Um, haven't really gotten much pushback. Uh, someone says, get rid of it. Otherwise, you'll forget that it's done. Um, throwing things away is the best part. Emily, that's a, that's a great statement for <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah, ma making sure that language in the donor agreement is important, right? Some sometimes that's easy to overlook. Right. I think we can move on. Okay. Um, how do you approach preserving the original order of digital files collected on physical carriers when arranging and describing? Do you tend to arrange files where that original order might be important into apes that correspond with the original carriers, or prefer an intellectual arrangement that divides files in a more content-based way and store the original order in some other way? And this is from Brock. Thank you so much for this question. So we've got some good answers happening here. Um, I fear... Too often we try and arrange born digital collections and it can break interdependent files. I prefer to keep everything in the original structure and have the archivist arrange virtually through finding aids. Next answer, we export files from media objects or their disk images into directories with the unique ID that we apply to each object. So all the files from an object stay together. We then package everything into an ape for the collection or accession when there are accruals over time. We use the unique IDs to tie everything together when describing in a space. Next answer, we use a directory that corresponds to each media carrier, then copy the files as is. We keep the files in original order in an ape. They may be described in multiple locations in finding aid though, which addresses the intellectual arrangement. This one says, it has more to do with our DAMs and its UI than anything else. We can serve individual files as objects, apes, or serve files as components of a multi-file ape with object and component level metadata. Everything's full text searchable, but search results are object level and users need to click through all the components to find the one they want. For situations where a disk doesn't have many files, we treat the entire thing as one ape and transcribe any labels, annotations in the metadata. If it's a large or complex arrangement of files, we treat each file as an ape to avoid creating giant objects that would make it harder to find specific files and include the original disk ID, annotations, and directory tree parent folder in the metadata to document the original order and keep files together. And finally, I try to envision whether the creator arranged the files across various carriers with an order in mind or out of necessity. We also tend to keep the carriers together as one SIP unless they are very large and we need to divide them. This is so that dips we provide to researchers are manageable in terms of download size. Those are some very thorough answers um, and some really great advice. Just kind of checking the chat. Seems like most of this is still going off about disposal. Okay. 
not seeing anything else, I don't think. Um, I think this was very thoroughly answered. Thank you so much, everybody. Great question. <laughs> All right. Um, as a new BitCurator user, one thing I have noticed in testing is that Brunhilde reports run on a on the carved disk image file, which often have changed file create and modified dates. In this case, working with fat floppy disk images. Do you tend to run these reports on mounted images and further down the line copy files for mounted images to better preserve this information? Or do you rely on this metadata on the metadata captured by FileWalk in DFXML records uh, to store this sort of information and worry less about the file itself retaining it? As I understand it, this data retention problem has to do with TSK recovers function. We have one answer thus far. Uh, does TSK recover, uh, which this is, that's part of the sleuth kit, in case we've said the sleuth kit in other parts of this conversation, does TSK recover bring over file system metadata? I didn't think it was intended to do that, which is to say, I wouldn't see it so much as a problem with TSK Recover, but just the way that it is designed to work. Yeah, that, that has been my experience as, as well. TSK, you know, FileWalk kind of relies on the sleuth kit um, and other, you know, to, 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 to run in some of its ways. And so I, I kind of view them as kind of, um, modular tools, you know, operating under some of the same things. So, so iWalk is documenting things so that TSK Recover doesn't have to sort of. Um... Uh, another answer here, rely on FileWalk. Uh, the disk image processor will apply last modified dates from DFXML to CAR files. This is another plug for the Canadian Center for Architecture's disk image processor tool. Um, which, which I have tested in the past and is, it is a fun one to run with. Don't see anything else at the moment. And I don't see anything else in chat. So maybe one more refresh. All right, we can move on. If you're setting up a digital processing workstation, which computer or operating system do you find the best to run a big curator environment? Or which ones are best for digital processing in general? Um, first answer, I prefer Linux, but it's because I'm most familiar with it and find that its tools are best for what I do, handling squirrely stuff. That said, there is one Windows tool I find indispensable, and my primary work computer is a Mac. I would say that mirrors my exact setup, too. <laughs> For the person who answered this question, if you wouldn't mind sharing what the indispensable Windows tool is, um, that I would love to know that. That was me. Um... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I find um, ISO Buster kind of like the yeah break glass in case of emergency Windows program, but I didn't want to sound like I was like, you know, promoting them too much. <laughs> no, I agree. Plus one to ISO Buster, <laughs> a few, and tree size, tree size Pro. Reasons to have uh, Windows available. Some agreement in chat. Okay, I'll give it. Just another second, but I think we've got this one covered. Ah, I use a dual boot machine with Windows and Linux BitCurator installed. Cool. Thanks, everybody.
yeah, all right. Um, where am I? Oh, yes. Can anyone point me toward resources or chime in with your experience regarding preserving the data from iPods and iPhones? One answer here, uh, there's a book chapter on preserving data off an iPhone from the ALA store, uh, Digital Preservation Libraries Preparing a Sustainable Future. I went to a product demo several years ago from Magnet Forensics, which definitely is a uh, legal slash law enforcement tool set, but they have a lot of functionality around ripping smartphones. See anything else here? And at least before we move on, I think a, a question was missed, or maybe it came in via Progressive Stack. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, we can pop up to that. There is an uh, answer in the chat. Oh, a lot of tools for archiving iPhones uh, and such are pretty invasive. Needs a developer mode, right? Yeah, or I can see like you need to jailbreak the thing. Um, um, Ah, oh, I see this one. Okay, thanks for pointing that out, I missed that. Okay, how are people providing access to digital material that is reading room or on-site access only? When do you create your access files on demand or during processing? We have an answer here. We have a lockdown laptop, no internet connection, no USB ports work except one that our external hard drive with materials on it, physical port blockers, et cetera. I create access files during processing and have them stored and ready to go. We put them on the access external hard drive based on what disks the patrons request to see instead of the entire collection at once due to time, uh, space and time constraints. We're trying to come up with a better way at the moment. Um, while we're waiting for any other answers, I'll share that we have a virtual reading room that we use um, both for people actually coming in if they want to, um, but it functions so that folks don't have to come to our physical reading room, but it um, mimics the mediated experience of coming to the physical location uh, to access materials. Um, and there's a lot of documentation about that out in the world. We're still getting some answers about the iPhones and iPods in the chat in case people are curious about that. Here we go, another answer. We have a lockdown, no USB ports turned on, no internet access Windows laptop that patrons can use in the reading room, no virtual reading room. We create access files on demand so I can talk to the researcher about potential normalization or migration issues. Currently creating access files on demand and pushing to a reading room laptop that's locked down, but I can remotely push files to when it's plugged into the ethernet. That's cool. Okay. Not seeing anything coming up in chat. Give this one one more minute. Ah, there we go. Bunch came in. Great. We use a virtual reading room and allow mediated offsite access, but for files where that isn't an option, we have a lockdown desktop in the reading room. Access copies are created at the end of processing. We also have a non networked laptop for on site, and we have a virtual reading room researchers can access through desktop virtualization of a remote server. 
And last answer, we have a dedicated workstation in the reading room and have an access tool called Scope so researchers can search for relevant dips and a link to that. Another CCA tool, that's awesome. Library of Congress has new lockdown born digital workstations in the manuscripts reading room and is also making access copies available in our campus only portal stacks. There's documentation about our reading room laptop here under reusable base image for born digital access with a guide to um, a Yale site. Thank you for that. One more before we move on. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Some great answers to that question. All right, let's see where we are. I'm seeing one more that's floated to the top on my oh, view. Yep, thank you so much. Great. So, how do you properly connect? five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive using a floppy disk converter to a Windows computer. I recently attempted this, but was not successful. Everything is connected, but the computer isn't recognizing the drive. I'm not sure if I'm missing a step. Um, that's a great question. I, I'm not sure what floppy disk converter the, the question asker is using. Um, My experience has been both with the FC5025 and the Cryoflux board, both of which I have been successfully able to get to connect to a Windows computer. So I don't, don't exactly know um, if they're, both of those involve both the hardware itself and a piece of software that kind of controls the hardware. Um, so there, there may be a, 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 an extra step needed that I'm just not seeing in this question. Well, if others have answers, Dylan Henry in the chat has the same issue. Dylan, can you maybe elaborate on what, what tool you're using? All right, we can maybe percolate on this one for a while. Um, of course, anything that comes up in the chat or comes up afterward can always be added to this uh, knowledge base. Dylan actually just answered your question. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, Grease Weasel, which I, oh, that's new to me. Um, I can get external power to the drive and I can get Grease Weasel connected to the USB. Isn't totally working. <laughs> that's that's the downside. Amanda May troubleshooting live. Sounds like your driver may be a problem. Um, I know that is often the problem with the cryoflux, getting the driver uh, kind of configured properly. I have an answer that came through the air table. Heard recently heard someone say that Windows 10 doesn't do well with floppy disk readers. I think they managed to get access uh, by using an older version, Windows 7, I think. That's a bummer. Uh, eventually, Windows 7 won't be supported. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, so I, I think the, the potentially looking at drivers and, and configuring drivers or making Windows understand the driver exists um, is one option. Trying an older version of Windows may be another option. Um, yeah, let's, let's maybe move on to the next one. Okay, I think this is the next one we haven't answered yet. 
How do you manage preservation cycles for materials with long retention schedules? Are there tools or mechanisms for flagging when a retention schedule ends and facilitating disposition slash destruction? While we're waiting for other answers to come in, um, again, the system that I work with, LibSafe, uh, has functionality for flagging uh, materials and kind of noting their retention schedules and kind of indicating holds and things like that. So that's how we plan. We don't, we're not really doing it right now, but that's how we plan to handle it in the future. Not seeing anything else coming through chat or Airtable. Okay, um, I think we can move on to the next one and maybe if we have time at the end, we can come and check back on this one and see if we've got any more answers. Yeah, so how do you organize and keep track of your various cords and dongles with working for working with various kinds of external devices? It's a great question. Um, uh, there's several answers. Uh, the first is badly. If someone has the perfect solution, please take pictures and let all of us know. Uh, second answer is the big box of cables. Um, I can second that one <laughs> uh, for us. Um, third answer, that's a great uh, suggestion, a pegboard on the wall with hooks and uh, with hooks for cables. There's a company called Wall Control that sells a nice one. Uh, and finally, I have a filing cabinet. Everything is in a folder that is numbered and labeled. I have a spreadsheet with numbers and labels. Unfortunately, I have acquired more things and haven't gotten a chance to add them to the organized system. I also try to document my workflows for each external device type and include the name number of each piece of equipment I use. Two great strategies and big box of cables. Um, I use plastic bins for adapters, which I organize by type. Um, again, second, um, the small plastic labeled bins and then a second for pegboard. I note that I have a wall in one of, in one of our rooms that is blank right now. Maybe you could put a pegboard on it. A label maker, I label every cord at either end and use Velcro wraps to bundle them together. That's a great idea. Ice cream buckets in the chat, that's a good one. A plug for helping create more empty ice cream buckets. Yeah, so there's some great ideas involving containers and wall mounting. Leave one more refresh and maybe we can move on. Yeah, one more saying labels, if they're specific to a device label, we, we label both the label and the, I'm sorry, but the cord and the device. Great ideas. Hopefully that helps the question answer or question asker. Awesome. All right. Let's get on to the next one. What is the best way for seasoned archivists to gain experience working with born digital records and workflows? Since we are not in the demographic for internships, 
are there any hands-on trainings or volunteer opportunities out there? Not just workshops and certificates that discuss how to do it, but actually working with it. A couple of answers here. Do you have a nearby institution that's doing this work that would let you come for a day and work with them, either on your materials or theirs? Find a place to volunteer. Our profession has a lot of rules regarding unpaid volunteers doing the work of professionals, which makes sense, but also feel like I'm missing out on professional development for stuff that became necessary post-school. Um, and then do you have access to staff who might be willing to cross-train? Oh, I misread that second one. That was how to find a place to volunteer. So a follow-up question to that. Try stuff on your personal records. I've done that. It's a good suggestion. Okay. Not seeing anything else in chat. I'll give it one more refresh and then I think we can move on. All right. Ooh, um, all right. Let me try and, sorry, I'm trying to catch up. How do you shake? imposter syndrome, especially when your colleagues come to you for digital archives advice, but you really spent all day Googling what to do. <laughs> Anything immediately? Yeah, fake it till you make it in the chat. A couple of couple of different examples there or plus ones. Uh, Tori, you have your hand up. Would you like to? Uh, yeah. Um, honestly, I think part of it is knowing that, like, you have to know what to Google. Um, so you do have knowledge, and you're trying to build on it. It's not like I have absolutely no idea here. It's I have kind of an idea of what's going on and I know how to find the answer. I mean, that's kind of our whole field is about like being able to find things um, and being able to find information and know what to do with it. So in that sense, even if I don't know specifically what to do, I have that, oh, I know how to find stuff to rely on. Plus I'm already kind of used to uh, being one of my family's tech support people, which has meant I've spent most of my life answering people's questions by Googling the problem and seeing what came up. <laughs> I have plenty of experience being a local expert who really just Googled everything in like the past five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Tori. Um, some other answers uh, clearly in the, uh, in the Table uh, mid career, spend all day Googling, knowing what Google, what to Google is half the job. Start by remembering that others wouldn't even know what questions to ask Google, what sources to look to, and how to read those sources. That's great. Um, these are great coping mechanisms. Um, yeah, oh, great in the chat. Admit what you don't know to your colleagues. I think it took me a long time to get to the point where I was comfortable saying, I don't know. <laughs> More here. Yeah, what do you know? Not a glib response. Figure out what you're confident in and work from there. I tried this because I know that and logically one leads to the other. At some point you have to come to terms with the fact that this field is always changing and there's no way anyone knows everything. You know how to Google, find the information and try your hand at troubleshooting when things don't go to plan. You're doing great. <laughs> I realize developers spend most of their time Googling as well. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Um, regarding colleagues, maybe you could explain to them that there are so many kinds of technology and no one person can be an expert in everything. We're always learning and that's important. 
Try to remember that imposter syndrome is about the environment and not individual psychology. Then, get, then I get the person asking to work through the issue with me rather than dropping off the request. Did a developer bootcamp and Googling was part of the curriculum. Locating and parsing info is an important skill. And the story of my life right now that I've been trying to incorporate, that's a good question. I don't know, but let me look into it. They're all great responses. One more that's showed up, accept web searching as a job skill and fake it till you, oh, these are all from the chat, I believe. Um, yeah. So this has been a really good uh, conversation about imposter syndrome. I, I feel like it's, it's shared widely, even amongst those of us who have been in the field for a while now. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, maybe perhaps we can move on. There's been a great conversation. Um, I, I, Katie Martini is like, yes, yeah, second your, your point about this is great uh, group therapy. This was a very great question. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay. If you don't run BitCurator on a dedicated Linux workstation. Has anyone found an alternative to VirtualBox that doesn't have licensing fees to run it with? Uh, we have an answer. If you're using Windows, I would look at Hyper-V Manager, which should be built into Windows. A second in case anybody else has any other recommendations. Oh, thanks, Jess. Dropped in some uh, useful tips for migrating to Hyper-V. Okay, I think that's it for this one for now. So we'll move on to the next. Thanks, everybody. All right, so in the digital archives field, we often throw around the term at scale when discussing moving from small to large scale work. But what do we mean by that? Is it about files or storage? If so, how many files? How much storage capacity are we talking about? Are, are we talking about when working quote at scale? Or is it about process and automation or both? This is a, a um, big question. A um, couple answers already here. It, I think it means either on, either or both file count and file size. Generally, when, when does it become really hard for the archivist to touch everything, AKA, man, AKA manually process it? Are there things that you can automate so that some of your workload is being borne by the robots? In other words, for now the archivist can touch everything and do all the work, but if the number of things to touch goes up, then everything is going to fall apart. Second answer uh, notes that it's a good question. Uh, for me, it depends on the audience. I just use the phrase at scale when call at, with colleagues to imply that they didn't want to approach doing the work manually one at a time. In the IT realm, at scale is a completely different scale. I can second that first response. When is it too much for me to do manually? Turning to that last question for a minute, Jacob in the chat points out that Hyper-V isn't necessarily already installed into Windows. You have to install it manually yourself. I, yeah. 
this one. Context dependent, important reminder to define words in context, especially when cross uh, when talking cross department or cross institution. That's a good point. Not seeing anything in chat on this. Moment for additional answers to come in. I believe we can move on. We got one more answer in the chat, Farrell. Oh, thanks. Uh, yes, Tori, I think at scale is when it's not feasible to do things manually or include a high level of intervention or when we either need to start automating or figuring out what we it's a, a good uh, um, uh, addition to the kind of manual. All right. Next question. Um, I've been trying to better align our rate of acquisition of born digital files with our staffing levels without much success. I'm curious to know how much others are acquiring in relation to their staffing levels. How many staff do you have working on capture, appraisal, and processing of born digital materials? And how many files do you acquire in a year? Um, the reactions are funny. Sorry, I'm laughing. Um, the first answer is if you figure out how to do this, write a paper about it so that we can all do it too. Seriously, um, in chat, lol, sub at this question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, we have four full-time archivists and two part-time. Wow. Uh, one and a half are designated digital archivists responsible for developing acquisition workflows, preservation and access management, while other archivists contribute to bulk of processing slash arranging born digital collections. Our born digital accessions have greatly increased in size in the past couple of years. Five and a half terabytes of video is a recent example. And it seems that the more time we devote to documenting acquisition workflows and needs by source, how can we facilitate email transfers? The more material comes our way. Um, from chat, too much with not enough people without enough people. Yeah, I'm feeling this very acutely right now because um, technically I'm the only designated person working on digital archives, but I've also shifted a lot more towards digital preservation, which is taking me away from being able to process. Um, and we sort of had one staff member who was a point person for digital processing besides me and they are now gone and we haven't had a replacement. So we're kind of rethinking our entire program structure and I'm hoping one day they'll let me hire somebody else. <laughs> We've been doing a lot of capacity building among our current staff. Sorry, Farrell, was that you? Well, I was just gonna say Alice has a raised hand. When get oh, moment. thank you, I didn't see that. Um, I'll read this one and then Alice, all you. We've been doing a lot of capacity building among our current staff, aka building skills and training to help take up the slack, but there are definitely some overworked born digital specific folks who are tired. Yeah. Alice, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm basically in the same position. I'm the the tired born digital specific person. Um, and yeah, part of the challenge of of being asked, like, okay, how much can we bring in? How much do you have capacity to do? is that I need to both work on acquiring the stuff and training more staff to be able to sort of that transition. <laughs> um, that transition from me being the person who is really hands-on with this to uh, training people so that they can take more of a hands-on role and I can take more of a, a training and specialist and I come in when things get complex role, ideally. Um, and yeah, we're just in the staffing out process of ideally when we have more born digital specific folks, then that transition will be a little easier. But I don't know how to say how much we can bring in in the in the midtime because, yeah, tired born digital. <laughs> Thanks. I want to call out Jess's response in chat just that this is not we, we should I mean, it, we're all digital curators or curators. 
this is also a, a problem with physical collections as well. It's not just a, a digital problem. That is definitely true. Although I find it interesting that uh, sometimes it's hard, in my experience, sometimes it's been hard to argue for more, um, pulling more time from the folks processing physical, even if we, even if we actually could, um, even if we had the space to do that, sometimes there's still some resistance from people, I think, to wanting to have to learn all of it. Um, and that in my personal experience has held things up occasionally. We have some other answers coming in. Okay, um, let's see. Part of our triage approach for backlog and new accessions is, are we ever going to process this realistically? That's a great question to ask. Um, first of all, it is not your personal individual responsibility to right size collecting to resources the admin have declined to provide. Set boundaries for what you will and won't do. Figure out what you can and can't say no to. Build a network of support. Bring your union and any other staff representation into it. Make it clear this is a matter of equitable working conditions, not being made to take on more work without the resources, as well as a matter of fairness and equity for the people whose records you're trying to care for. Yeah, that is such a great, great answer to this question. So important. Um, I just wonder how much this is, I think this is Jess's uh, answer from the chat, so I won't reread that, but yeah. LV, oh, Elena in chat said, I don't have to crunch the numbers, so I just cover my eyes. I'm the only digital archivist, but I do not process. We will soon have a second processing archivist. Our two field archivists have taken on appraisal very early in the process, which helps reduce the material amount, but it still outpaces our ability to process. Sarah says, Ooh, go ahead. I was going to say Tori has a raised hand. As oh, well. yep. Please, Tori. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So um, I think, at least at my institution, I'm in a better position than I was, say, four years, three, four years ago. Um, I have had a lot of support in and interest in from um, my colleagues in um, cross training. So in practice, um, I am definitely going to come in when things get complicated. I am definitely going to be more involved on the, like getting materials ready for other archivists to process them side of it. But at the same time, I mean, it's, it's better than it was in that I am no longer the go-to person for everything. And, you know, if I, I don't even know, was just unexpectedly out of the office for two weeks, things would continue to function. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's, it's just a, a fact of being an archivist. There's always going to be more stuff coming in than you can reasonably or responsibly take care of. I wish this wasn't a fact. It, a lot of great people have a lot of have had a lot of great discussions about problems with that and ways that we might be able to move forward. But at the end, a lot of it comes down to institutional priorities, administrative priorities, and it's really tough to go to high level people at your institution and ask them to slow their role. So, um, we, it, it always does come down to like Laura in the chat saying, you know, it, and um, somebody a bit further up to just always the case regardless of format. Thank you, Tori. We have some more answers coming in. I'll try to get through quickly because we are coming up to time. Um, Let's see. So I'm finding it hard to keep digital as a priority with processing colleagues. There is such a large paper backlog. They tell me they'd rather work with that. So I don't have an answer, just sharing pain, I guess. Um, this was from chat, which I think I had read. Um, this one, I think the under-resourcing of archival labor infrastructure is basically the defining personality trait of the archival profession. 
Uh, we have a digital technician, digital processing archivist, and digital archivist. We acquire a lot of digital stuff, and it feels overwhelming. Training others on the tools can be daunting, but most are eager to be trained in this area. We have one person, me, who works on capture and moving files through the workflow, and several curators slash archivists who do the appraisal and processing. We bring in about 500 to 600,000 files per year with a quite a bit of fluctuation, definitely more than we can handle right now. Oh, and I think this is the one I wanted to, oops, oh, geez, I just lost it. Where did that go? It was uh, Sarah's comment in chat, I believe, which is I'm yep. a new digital archivist yeah. position, and I see as part of my job is advocating and educating about how much work this all is for the folks who assumed I would come in and just quietly take care of everything, which is a yeah. great Yeah, I wanted to highlight that yeah. earlier because I think that's really important. Um, and if you can find somebody who can help advocate for just how much time it takes, um, we did do a cost assessment uh, for Born Digital Processing here over the last year or so, and um, that is helping a lot, uh, especially to show just how expensive it is to process disks and uh, other legacy media. If you can throw numbers at them, they tend to listen a little bit more. Um, Laura, Laura's had a several comments in the chat, but I think the one maybe to highlight here is, and maybe as a good wrap up note, is the important thing is is to not not necessarily buy in that there's a huge urgency because we are dealing with archives <laughs> that that have maybe been sitting around for for a while already. Um, there are specific situations, uh, but I, I think that's maybe a, a nice sentiment. Like we are we are working towards stuff that is supposed to be here for the long term. We're not necessarily trying to solve every problem immediately for all people. So lots of stuff coming in from chat. <laughs> I think we're at time. If I'm we're not at time, yeah. <laughs> As happens every year. <laughs> this session always goes so fast. And I know there's still, so everybody sees quite a lot of questions left um, that we didn't get a chance to go through, but please, uh, as you have time and are able, always recommend checking this out. We will leave these up. You can add answers to the questions. Um, for I think a good bit of time, like we'll leave it open. So thank you all so much for coming to this session and thank you all so much for your questions and your answers. This was so great and so helpful. Yes, thank you Annalise and Joe for, for co-hosting and, and uh, Alice and, and Nancy for, for handling things on the, on the program or forum committee side and for everyone's answers. <laughs>